transport in the time of COVID update today. Um, you know the form. Uh, email, you can email me for specific links or slides uh, on chairrdrf at aol.com. Okay, so what's been happening? Delay, 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 and delay. It's still a lot of delay, things taking a lot of time. So in general news, the delays have been, first of all, the updated national cycling and walking plan, which before COVID was due for June, uh, we still haven't seen that. Uh, the inspectorate still not on. The active travel commissioner being in charge of it, we don't know any more about. Uh, the update on how to do everything properly, um, which we've been talking about and which was delayed well before COVID, was due this summer, still don't know when it's due. Voucher scheme was due to start by the end of June. It started for the repairers, but not yet customers. This was talked about in the original announcement at the beginning of May. So, what's happened is that Cycling UK on Wednesday wrote a letter to the minister. There's the link for the full letter. Uh, and Roger Geffen said, Parliament rises in a week, that's later this week, and I don't know whether the cycling plan or any of the measures announced in May will be published before recess. And if not, whether this means that changing the way we move and an active travel recovery will be parked until September. So he was worried enough to write a letter to the minister. Um, so that's worthwhile looking at. Uh, in terms of what you can do to find out what's been happening in your area and to put pressure on your local authority to get the second tranche bids in by August the 7th, do go to that link uh, from Cycling UK. It always helps to have some more letters going in. Okay, this is away from the delay question. You'll have read uh, in initially in Laura Laker's article that Sustrans is losing a quarter of the miles of its national cycle network. It's not actually a loss as such. What they're doing is reclassifying their routes. So uh, those parts of it which are just not suitable for people starting out cycling will be taken off the map and in fact already are off the uh, Ordnance Survey map on which you have uh, the National Cycle Network uh, superimposed. Uh, Xavier Bryce, who's the uh, CEO of Sustrans, has said, we aren't cutting these sections loose. Um, we realise how important they are to the local economies and people who use them. I just think we need to be more careful than we have been in the past about designating them as part of the NCN. This, he said, is part of the long-term vision of paths for everyone. They have to be uh, available for people who are not experienced, fully able-bodied cyclists. Okay, so I'm putting this up again from last week. The second tranche of the Emergency Active Travel Fund invitation was sent out on July the 10th. Uh, you can see the letter there and uh, it's 480 million pounds compared to the first tranche of 45 million. And uh, do make sure that your highway authority outside London, I'm not sure about inside London, but outside London in England has sent off its bid by Friday the 7th. And there again are the points about um, schemes that do not meaningfully alter the status quo on the road will not be funded. So we need to keep an eye on that. Uh, and funding in the second tranche will also depend on how swiftly and effectively authorities have implemented the plans for which they have received funding in the first tranche. And I'm putting up this report again, 
the carbon impact to the National Roads Programme uh, by Lynn Sloman and Lisa Hopkinson, backed up by Professors Goodwin and Annabel and uh, Kevin Dawson as well, and how the DFT have, have said it's no good without actually bothering to go through the uh, calculations in it. Very important report to read. Uh, don't forget this, uh, this logo is still doing rounds for how Edinburgh isn't good enough and we've had enough of not good enough facilities. Okay, now a section on policing. Now this lady here, uh, Catherine Miles, was cycling in Oxford uh, with her cargo uh, bike with one of the kids behind and police officers came up to her and said sorry you shouldn't be cycling here it's not safe for you and of course some of us would say well if it's not safe because of motorists driving illegally maybe you should address the police officers and then the Lord Mayor of Oxford said I'm sorry uh, Thames Valley Police I know you meant well but this is outrageous you should be stopping the car drivers that are making our roads dangerous. Um, and uh, uh, you can read the story there. And uh, some good news uh, for once from Northamptonshire. Uh, the chief constable there said, uh, as promised an update following a request for Northamptonshire police to contact all those who submit dash cam footage to the force with a progress and outcome report uh, haven't been doing so, but we want to, we will. So that's a step forward from them. Um, and this was all in the news because of uh, something that Jeremy Vine put out uh, because of cycling Mikey uh, getting up to his uh, grand total, uh, or I think it was one of the others actually. Um, and uh, uh, so, so Jeremy Vine said, uh, what do you think about this? And lots of uh, people vented their bile and spleen and whatnot. Uh, British Cycling said, uh, made a reply, and Superintendent Cox made a reply as well. Um, let's see what Superintendent Cox from Metropolitan Police said in more detail. He said, I encourage the use of head cam uh, and believe it has dangerous driving deterrence investigative and enforcement benefits. I feel it has made a difference in terms of cycling safety by raising awareness of issues such as close pass and is influencing improvements in driving standards. Now, that's a pretty big support. So, you know, why not get your local road safety officers or anybody else to get in dash cam, head cam, light cam, you can use smartphones, um, to do that. And I just want to say something about the British cycling thing. They say the fact that people wear helmet cameras is a sad indictment of how safe they feel when riding on the road. We'd like to see far greater resources given to road policing so that people wouldn't need to take matters into their own hands. Now, I just want to make a couple of points about that. Uh, first of all, it's not just cyclist cams, it's dash cams. Those are most of the third party reportings going in. And it's for the safety of all road users. A lot of uh, those of you who drive cars should have dash cams. They, they're not expensive now and uh, you can get uh, your third party insurance reduced and uh, very useful in terms of insurance claims. And um, police services have been asking for the, 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 the uh, footage. The other thing BC saying taking matters into their own hands suggests something illegal like doing violence to offenders. This isn't, you know, all this stuff about vigilantes. It's not vigilantism. It's just reporting crimes for the police. So there you go on policing. Uh, and uh, there's the reference from Superintendent Cox. Okay, now, uh, the bike lash. Uh, we've been getting pushback, often without a push, or bike lash without the lash. There was the investigative story in The Guardian there uh, with a uh, sort of list of various um, examples of schemes being pulled and a nice graphic there in The Guardian. Um, I think the reporter from The Times 
uh, basically reported the content or repeated the content of the Guardian. Uh, not saying they were just copying from it, but it looked a bit like that. Um, and uh, Chris Boardman when it was on the radio talking about that, and he made a very important point that you shouldn't sort of just throw your hands up. Because, for example, the Trafford Lane, which I reported a few weeks back, had been pulled, was a short section of Lane, you know, ideally wouldn't have been pulled, but Trafford have also been putting in lots of pop-up schemes which are quite useful. So don't get too panicky about it. Ealing pulled and low traffic neighborhood, but they've been putting in various advisory cycle, uh, no, they've been beefing up their advisory cycle lanes, making them wider, putting in wands, doing other bits and pieces. So look at the whole picture. Another point, if you look at this graphic, they're saying uh, they've gone in, they've added up the number of, of uh, uh, oppositions in consultations per head of the population and the highest in London is 25.3 in Westminster per 100,000 residents which actually means one person in every 400 so it's not necessarily that large number of people okay uh, some sort of where there's been problems in Northamptonshire um, found out that after doing a freedom of information, the council didn't have any minuted meetings where they'd actually been seen to discuss the emergency active travel fund. Uh, so a letter went in to the councillors from various green groups there, and they've said, you know, please be more transparent and tell us what's going on. Um, an example of what has been going in, that's in Kettering. That's quite interesting. Footwear extension there. Note the way in which there are these gaps in the footwear extension. Uh, one of the problems we've been getting with them is that they block off pedestrian desire lines. All right, so here I am. So it's the women's skirts uh, thing. Uh, Rachel McLean, uh, the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State at the Department for Transport, uh, according to uh, Adam at All Party Parliamentary Cycling Walking Group, said she thought uh, cycling is fantastic, it's great, something DFT backs, but it's not right for everybody, particularly women who are traveling to work wearing a skirt or a dress and not able to shower when they get there. So. Q alley rolling and lots of tweeting about with women in skirts and dresses. So I thought I'd get in on it and I did lots of women in skirts. And here's my first one. There's a nice lady from Kenya with uh, uh, four kids on her bicycle. Um, uh, you thought it was all going to be Danish and Dutch 22 year old blondes on bikes, but uh, you naughty people, there she is. Um, and here's actually one, that, that was quite a good graphic from uh, Transport for London, quite a, quite a, a good one a few years ago. Uh, that's Amsterdam, since you want Amsterdam. Uh, that's from the Moda City people. There's another one of Amsterdam actually not too many, only one lady there in a dress, but you get the picture. Now, I think this is worthwhile mentioning because the day after this Twitter pylon, um, uh, uh, Mrs. McLean, who's uh, got responsibility for transport decarbonization and the environment, um, felt that she had to tweet this, and there she has a picture of herself wearing a dress on a, on a Brompton saying, oh, I've been using a bike for decades, wearing all kinds of skirts and heels. So, you know, I do think seriously there was uh, uh, some kind of pressure. Now, what also happened last week is some uh, C-list celebrity said she hated cyclists and wanted to kill them. And after a lot of pressure from people like um, Jeremy Vine, she said, oh, I'm very sorry, I didn't really mean it, it was a joke, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go on bike rides and uh, please be nice to me. So, you know, when you get the pushback and the bile, do push back against it nicely and politely, 
that you can get results. Okay, stuff that's gone in on the ground in uh, the UK, uh, stuff there in Cardiff. Uh, now, this is an important one. Evening Hill in Poole. Uh, it's important because you can see uh, you've got the pop-up there. I haven't got anything on the other side, but it doesn't really matter so much with hills uh, because you can take the lane a lot more easily when you're going downhill. The issue is having one up the hill if you have to choose. And what was also good about this is that 43 car parking spaces have been removed. A lot of opposition, but it was done. So that's a good result. Now, uh, bad Lancaster, uh, car in advisory cycle lane, no wands or cylinders. Cylinders. I think that's a uh, uh, footwear extension there. Lancaster is pretty crap. Any of you who've uh, been around the one-way system know it's a very good way uh, to not do a pedestrianised town centre. That Sheffield, got this photograph from Pete Z. That looks like quite a nice pop-up cycle lane there. Uh, used to have just that. Uh, now you've got big markings here and a big advisory cycle lane. London. Yes, the big news. Uh, here's the ministerial announcement from uh, Grant Shapps. He's appointing two people to the TfL board uh, with what he calls a specific skill set and he's made direct ministerial appointment. So Gilligan is back in there in TFL. And if he wants any help, I'm here, Andrew. Okay, so Gilligan's in there somewhere. Uh, London, here we go again. This, is, this went in last night. This is westbound Euston Road. Thank you, Hackney Cyclist, for this. This was the bus lane, and you can see cycle logos are on it there. The bus lane has been moved out. I don't know what kind of floating bus stop things they're going to have to cross over the cycle lane. Something, I assume. We'll see that in the fullness of time. Um, it's uh, due to be completed by the end of August. Uh, now, there is a consultation out from today from Transport for London. All Londoners, please fill this in. It's for 24 seven bus lanes, which would give us an extra 80 kilometers for cycling. Um, that's bus lanes that are already there for cycling, but making them 24 uh, seven. I personally think that would be a good thing. Uh, so don't forget to fill in that consultation. Um, just some stuff about the uh, um, uh, funding in London. This is uh, from Caroline Lunt, uh, Russell Green, MLA. She's been pointing out that uh, we've had a cut because of the reduction in the uh, TfL overall budget. And she's saying next year, TfL's budget is just £98 million. After that, the budget is basically empty. Um, uh, without that, there'll be no new cycleways, etc. This is not the time to be cutting investment in walking and cycling. Uh, I raised this looming in black hole with the mayor last month. He insisted borough funding wouldn't be cut and there would be more schemes. And uh, his announced casts made me doubt his ability to make those commitments. Well, uh, so you can look that up on Twitter. Uh, she's making the same points there, saying the mayor is being too slow and opaque. Uh, in an answer, his office gave me late last week, he claimed that street space for boroughs would continue, but there's no reflection of this in today's paper. Um, and he spoke to The Guardian about plans for car-free areas in central London, like Westminster Bridge, uh, sorry, like Waterloo Bridge. They were under impression changes would be completed within six weeks. Uh, but none have been delivered. Um, that's her view, you know, she may be wrong. Now, I want to spend a bit of time on this. This was an article by Simon, who's here uh, from LCC. Uh, it's a must read for Londoners. Those of you outside London should also read it, I think. I've made some uh, abridgments. Um, 28 London boroughs appeared to receive their full 100k 
with uh, some of the bad ones um, not only getting half. I did note after Roger Stocker showed me what the bid was that Hillingdon has got 100k despite a bid which clearly misreads or ignores the instructions. Um, all boroughs, according to the initial guidance, need to start work on DFT funded schemes within less than three weeks. Oh, it's now going to be two weeks and finish them within eight weeks of starting to avoid risk of funds being clawed back. Um, the deadline for the funding of tranche two is 7th of August in England. We don't know if that applies in London. Bids will be for a total pot for all London boroughs. We're not quite sure how much of that will be for TFL's own roads by itself. Um, the split seems to be 50-50 between cycle routes on the one hand and low traffic neighborhoods, school streets and pavement widening schemes on the other. I have a suspicion, I know unofficially from the one Traditionally bad borough has put in a bid for school streets without apparently actually knowing what they are. Um, for round two, there can be sort of less uh, so-called, there can be more softer measures such as cycle parking, but only as part of a bigger scheme. Uh, so you can't just say, oh, I'm going to put in some cycle parking. Um, and Simon says, uh, it's like all boroughs will struggle to deliver to tight deadlines in this crisis, but some boroughs particularly are being handed a lot of money without much track record to match. That's his worry and mine as well. Do read that article. And Simon finishes saying, we'd like to see TFL, or he says in it, we'd like to see TFL and City Hall providing boroughs with more of these three things. First of all, clarity, um, you know, what is it that you're actually getting money to, to do because some boroughs are perhaps not clear. Um, uh, they'd like to see clarity about what the money is for, who's got it, how much. Uh, secondly, mentoring. Since a lot of boroughs haven't been putting in proactive travel stuff, they may not know what to do. And we haven't got the, the updated LTN out, so they can do with some mentoring with uh, people like Brian saying, no, you ought to do this and holding their hands. And finally, oversight to make sure that they actually do what they're saying. You know, I would have thought that uh, Hillingdon Council, if they send in a bid like that, uh, they need to have people saying, sorry, um, actually this is against the instructions so we can't fund you at least not 100 percent so there does need to be that oversight often that kind of monitoring and examination doesn't happen in local authorities and it should so those are three important points which need to happen in london and elsewhere okay so more on london uh here's a scheme um, which has been announced, uh, Seven Dials, if you know that, in uh, 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 just the other side of Soho. Uh, a lot of bits and pieces, timed road closures, manned timed road closures, uh, various bits and pieces of amendment. Um, uh, you, you, there's always, be, there already been various changes. as a kind of semi-shared space around the actual Seven Dials itself, and that will be an interesting scheme. Also, um, George from Camden Cyclists sent me an update on where they are. Uh, the, uh, it's a bit late, so we're going to do it next week. But there's one scheme in particular which you should note, which is Prince of Wales Road eastbound, um, and that's proceeding quite nicely. Uh, one thing you need to know is is the 46 parking spaces have been taken out. It was pushed back, Camden have carried on. Well done, Camden. That's important. Uh, here's just an old one, actually, Islington, St. Peter's, low traffic neighborhood. Um, now, two ways you can see what's happening in London. 
Uh, for example, here's a still of Wilmot Place in Camden, low traffic neighborhood. Some people complain that cargo bikes, bikes couldn't go through these bollocks. Uh, I don't think that's true, I think there is. But there's this guy, John Stone, who's a reporter. He's not really up to speed on all the technical details, but that's fine. He's basically saying, I'm an ordinary cyclist. I'm going around London. I'm seeing these things happen. Some of them are quite good. Some I don't understand. And he's sticking these things up on his Twitter feed. And they're quite a good indicator of what's happening. But what will, also, what will also, some of them are in video, but what will also be happening on video is that Alex Ingram for Cycling Embassy of Great Britain will be doing virtual safaris. Uh, go to that link there and then you will be able to sort of watch him or other people doing uh, videos of lots of cycle facilities uh, throughout London. Uh, here's a little nice tweet from the ever-readable Councillor Burke, who's in charge of the Environment Committee in Hackney, and he's making a very basic green point. Uh, Johnson wants you to spend hours every day away from your family, travelling to places you do not need to visit for the sole purpose of sustaining an economy predicated on excessive con consumption that's incompatible with his own government's decarbonisation targets. While I acknowledge that economic restructuring is required in order to minimize the externalities arising from fewer commuters, uh, if you think that's a challenge, you're going to be stunned by the alternative, namely climate change. So he's saying, don't forget the basic thing about whether you need to travel in the first place. Uh, here's a nice graphic of what Hammersmith Bridge could look like from Johnny Blackmore. London's first green bridge. And I'm surprised nobody said, hey, how about a garden bridge? Nobody's ever thought about that. Um, here are all your campaigns as usual. Transport Action Network on the roads program. Um, don't forget Phil Goodwin's important article, uh, Transport for New Homes, Oxfordshire Liverpool Streets. Uh, Alex's blog, I've mentioned CBT report. Um, uh, there are a few basic things you've already seen them. Uh, yeah, Sustrans. And the, here are the two consultations one on policing I mentioned last week, and there's the 24 7 bus lanes. And finally, Here's a little interesting thing. No, it would be nice to see that in the back of a uh, car. Doing transport stay safety like a COVID-19 measure. No one should be allowed to drive again until there are no fatal crashes for 14 consecutive days. Then we can slowly begin to phase in certain classes of people who begin driving again, but only at half the posted speed limit. There's a nice thought. There you go. Yes. I thought I'd start with this picture. I uh, really like to get a bit of a pedestrian stuff in there. Um, and, and really, like, what this brings to mind is that my wife has a saying for me. She said, there's two types of people in the world. There's, uh, there's you and then there's everybody else. And, uh, and when it comes to like a traffic signal control, there's, uh, there's two types of uh, approaches in the world. There's like what the UK does and there's what the entirety of the rest of the world does. And either they're mad and we're right, or we're missing a little bit of a trick. And this this first picture is like a, and like the the moment really. I was crossing this uh, this uh, pedestrian crossing in where was I? Taiwan. I was already halfway across it. There's about nine lanes. This thing straight across. You can see by that countdown, I still had 50 seconds left to get to the other side, and I was like a a third of the way across. And you got to think, wow. What's going on here? Why have I got so much time to cross? And how am I crossing in a dead straight line across a humongous amount of lanes? So you've got to start thinking, well, if that was in the UK, I'd have about eight seconds to cross between four staggers, or frankly, they would have given up and sent me on a bridge over the top or in a tunnel underneath to get across roads like this, right in the city centre. So interesting. We'll, we'll come back to, to that as we go there. 
but note note the signals and the zebras signalized zebras we will get back to there but i'm going to do a really long-winded intro and i and i might even try and find a way of watching the the chat as uh, we go for this so if you feel like answering anything please do uh, i've also tried to get on multimedia here and show some videos just to make it complicated really why are we different why did we go one way and the entire rest of the world uh, go another when did this happen uh, I asked Phil Jones about this many years ago. He said it's all from the Geneva Convention on on traffic in 1949. I was uh, and I was looking at that um, like you do. And there's a there's an annex that we exempted ourselves on uh, on priority of passage. That seems to be like a uh, the year zero of a uh, of branching off and going our whole way. Uh, I remember Phil had a theory that it was like uh, well we we wanted to stick with imperial and uh, most of the rest of the world was going metric on signs and. And it all went a bit wrong, but but having read through the um, the papers from then, it seems a bit weird. So I thought I'd show uh, a um, a video from 1949 of how you cross the road. It's quite an interesting one. Let's have a look at this. It's a little bit offensive, but then everything in 1949 was offensive. Let me introduce you to Mr. A. Now, Mr. A is a perfectly straightforward kind of person. He reacts quite normally when there's dried egg for breakfast. When it's opening time, when his mother-in-law comes to stay, when he sees his bank balance, when someone slips on a banana skin, when he has bacon for breakfast. But when it comes to the everyday business of crossing the road, <laughs> uh, told man, well, never mind. Now, let's try and get this straight. You want to cross from here to there. Good. And it would be perfectly simple if it wasn't for the cars. Now, there are two ways of crossing. And this way. You see these two rows of studs. Well, all you have to do is to walk between the studs and you won't get knocked down. You see, the motorist has a legal obligation to give the pedestrian a right of way at crossings. Now, Hannah, shut yourself. Come on. It'll be all right. Really? No. Look out! No, no. There are some good common sense rules, you know. You must look where you're going. It is no good thinking you can have a sleep. Or eat your breakfast out there because you'll soon find yourself in trouble. You must keep on the move when you cross. Right, have another try. That's it. Good. Fine. Keep it up. Lovely. Splendid. Right. So, um, bonuses to people who spotted um, what kind of a crossing was that? He crossed four lanes and he did it straight away. It had a it had beacons, but it had a signal control crossing studs, and it had the right way, and there wasn't stop lines, and there wasn't giveaways. Uh, it was an interesting um, way to start. We'll uh, we'll come back to these as well. Uh, I hope you find these uh, interesting. Oh, and don't show the gun, Brian. There we go. All but done now. I always knew I'd mess it up when it comes to multimedia. Oh yeah, let's go to this one. Yeah, let's show another video. Um, this is the turn the corner one from like a couple of years ago, and I just uh, I just want to compare with uh, where we were in 1949 and what um, what the great man Mr. Boardman is saying here. The single most dangerous place for cyclists and pedestrians on our streets is here. Two thirds of all traffic accidents happen around junctions, and it's not difficult to see why. In fact, the highway code contains 14 different rules about how to negotiate them, many contradictory. The now accepted ambiguity this causes means that, in the real world, priority goes to the most threatening. To deal with this state of affairs, rather than change the rules, even more complexity has been added. Cycle lanes disappear at junctions exactly where they're most needed. Bike riders are left wondering if they should actually use that marked cycle lane on the inside, or would that be undertaking? And pedestrians are corralled into narrow crossing corridors and scurry across when they see a gap. So it's no surprise that cycling is intimidating and often off-putting 
for those who just want to pop into the shops. And why I'm scared to let my kids cross the road, despite the highway code giving them priority once they put their foot on the carriageway. Not a lot of point in being right and in hospital. No, the practical onus is wholly on them. But it doesn't have to be like this. In the vast majority of Europe and many other places in the world, junctions are dealt with in a very simple way, with one overarching rule for all road users. When you're turning, give way to anyone going straight ahead. A courteous road user will already do this. Slow down and let pedestrians cross. Check both mirrors for cyclists and motorbikes before turning, either left or right. This simple, unambiguous rule for all, cyclists aren't exempt, to give way when turning could halve the amount of accidents on our roads, as it does already in Europe. This will make things clearer for drivers too, which is why we're talking to the AA and the RAC. Help us bring safer roads for all of us one step closer. To help make our villages and towns more civilised places, particularly for our older and younger generation. Guidance that compels us to treat each other as human beings and not obstacles. Who wouldn't want that? All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that. So yeah, it's quite interesting that um really um when I started uh when I first met Chris Borden was around the turn in the corner campaign and we still very much have those issues. And you can see um in the video that we were talking about side roads and junctions and uh I've talked a lot over the past uh, year and a half, and as well as Chris, and we've been really focusing in Manchester on the side roads and the use of zebras there. But there's still the what do we do about signal control junctions? And I, I'll recommend everybody those raw reports are still available, the turn in the corner ones, and they're well worth a read. Um, there's, I'm going to unpick it a little bit as we get to signal junctions on this, but um, some of the analysis that Phil Jones did at the time was showing that if we did have the same rules, or we could get 40% more capacity at junctions, do straight across head crossings, uh, fit in cyclists without like a, a year's worth of arguments about lo loss of capacity. It's quite, um, it's quite a massive win. But yeah, let, let's start unpacking how, how can we start doing this sort of stuff and should we do this sort of stuff in the UK? Um, I want to talk about zebras again, and, and, and in this case, kind of mid-link zebras. I've shown a zebra here across a bus stop bypass, cause, uh, but this is uh, an issue across uh, all zebras. And that's really from a visually impaired people and, and ordinary people as well. Do you know that the car is going to stop? Or do you know that in this case, the cyclist is going to stop? It's a, it's a real issue and it's a reason that people, um, uh, particularly of the visually impaired, have, have a problem with zebras in general. They want to know that you can press the button, the light's going, they get an audible warning and then it's time to go and, and there's no kind of conflict with that movement. And when it comes to zebras, you, you have the priority to, to keep going and vehicles, cyclists and cars should should stop, but you don't necessarily know whether that right's been afforded to you as you wait there. And that was the issue we had at this uh, this bus stop. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to be general and not specific and talk about it, but uh, I have to talk about this one because it's quite an interesting bus stop. So it's right across the road from the... Um, um, the Blind Institute, or what's it called? I'm forgetting what it's called now, but the Blind Hospital, basically, in there. Yeah, I hospital. Thank you, thank you. Not like a, it's been a long day. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. So you have lots of visually impaired people uh, uh, crossing here, and uh, I went out on site and and walked it through with some of them. We're standing there and they go, look, I, I stand here and I know it's a zebra, but I don't know whether they're stopping or not. What can we do about it? So. Um, we gave it some thought and came up with some options on site. And I just, uh, I'm sharing a bit of stuff here. And this is, I asked Tyne Tom, uh, Tom Bailey, uh, Tyne Tom on Twitter, to have a little look at it for me based on some ideas that we were having. And he came up with quite an ingenious plan. And uh, and I kind of, I wanted to share this because he did some great work and there's, there's variations and different ways of doing it. But I thought it was such a great idea and really alleviated a lot of the concerns at bus stop bypasses and for me zebras in particular so as you can see there, there's a bus stop bypass and there's basically a camera mounted above that that looks down the track towards where cyclists are coming you've got a point of where the zebra is and people are kind of waiting there and um, if you're visually impaired you can kind of push a button and it give you some kind of audible warning as to whether cyclists are approaching or not and uh uh, I was talking this through with Ross Atkin as well, and we could give a visual warning whether approaching and also like their speed. It's all within the, the realms of science now to say that someone's approaching and they're slowing down to a stop. So there's something that I'd really like to research and I'm, I'm hoping as a, 
there's an interested party out there or i'm sharing this today because if someone just wants to pick up and research it themselves there's been there's been some really good work we did look at six or seven different options but we felt the kind of a push button rotating cone audible warning for whether someone's approaching or not is a is an interesting way to go now clearly like cyclists should stop clearly cars should stop when they're on the main road but you don't know whether they have or not and for me there's a, there's engineering solutions and there's technical solutions that we can do to do this i'm really like um in in terms of how i introduced the context it's that first step towards like a souping up zebras applying a push button to them almost like a making them smart than just like a some striped white lines um when we're talking about side road zebras that's a it's a priority junction but on a on a middling zebra you're really expecting the vehicle the more dangerous one the cyclist or the car to yield to it and to understand what that means but you're taking away their priority to do stuff to to make that happen so it, you never quite know where they're going to do it and there are lots of bus stop bypasses that i've looked at yeah, some cyclists will slow down, but quite a lot will just keep going. And that's a real issue if you've got like a, an impairment of any kind. So I think uh, like, like in all things, uh, I'm an engineer and there's engineering and technical solutions and things we could try. And I, I'm really hoping that we do start looking at these things uh, quite seriously because um, the issues that we have are really stopping the rollout of this kind of infrastructure. And for me, it's essential to maintain um, decent segregated cycle routes. And the pop-up lanes will be tight to now. So um, thanks for Tom to point that together. And I hope he doesn't mind me sharing it. I probably should have checked, but I only started doing this about an hour before I spoke. So uh, I had to put it in there. Now, I've got a, got a couple of uh, extremely geeky videos. Uh, this is the way I spend my holidays, uh, recording the sound of uh, push buttons so I can have like a, a range of audible like presentations uh, uh note the uh, signalized zebra on the left there's a really interesting one um see there's guidance tactile going across the uh the road that's that's a conversation for another time but but i was super excited about that the way the guidance met the uh, uh the uh, other tactile where you're standing waiting to press the button and then for someone tapping with a cane they can actually follow the line uh, right across the junction rather than what we do in the uk which is kind of attempt to line up the blisters even though you don't really know which way the blisters are orientated to, to head off across the junction quite good but anyway i'm just going to show you a, a little bit of an audible warning here just to get you in the mood so th imagine this on a bus stop bypass you know you could press it and it'll give you a tick down maybe uh maybe you're good to go there's no cyclists coming that's what this noise could mean there's stuff going on there and then you can see the flashing green there Upon rules. Very exciting, and let's uh, let's play one from um, from Dublin. So again, this is a nice calm. Don't go yet. Then a slightly panicky. Uh, it could happen. So, I mean, yeah, I've been looking at various sounds in there. For me, that, that second one's quite, quite an interesting one to use with that scenario of detection that, you know, we could give an audible warning where a visible one isn't possible by some people. So, uh, again, a, a very under-researched area in the country because we don't have conflict uh, allowed at our signal control junctions. Well, unless there's no green man at all, but when there is a green man, you know it's conflict-free, so we're... We're not as strong on the on the visual indicators. Now, obviously, there we go. Oh yes. So let's talk about what we could do next. That's the kind of middling one and something we could do. But another like application of like uh, the kind of signalized zebra to to do something is a is a junction like this. Um, this is this isn't actually that bad a one, but you might recognise where it is. It's Marlborough Road, right next to Madden Two Swords, the most popular tourist attraction in the entire United Kingdom probably a place would expect a few pedestrians by next to one of the main one um main stations as well in paddington well any pedestrians crossing here never have uh, any time whatsoever where the conflict free there's no green man indication people are stepping out and i've stood there many times and watch um watch our friends from across the continent start walking across there and get the shock of their lives when vehicles just turn in 
because Euston Road and Marlebone Road have got to keep rolling. And if we were to put like a pedestrian crossing there, that would mean there'd be a period where you couldn't keep Marlebone Road rolling. You'd have to stop it because they couldn't do that left. That would be a, a real issue. Stopping it to let the vehicles out from the sides, like one thing, but stopping them um, from getting the pedestrians. And that's, that's getting to three stages rather than just like the, the two not having that's the fundamental issue that we have in the UK um, particularly when you get outside of London so many of the, the signal control junctions don't have pedestrian crossings at all there's no green man uh, let alone getting to the point where we can get cycling because uh, a lot of the stuff we do for cyclists uh, rests upon us having uh, like a, a pedestrian stage that we can tap into and utilize that same time if people haven't even given that time then we've got a real problem so a junction like this where people are expecting, uh, particularly our European friends, to have some kind of priority as they walk across the road there and then get the shock of their lives. We could we could um, trial just putting some kind of marking. And maybe it could be done with the colourful crossing. I know a lot of people are looking at that. But for me, that's what our, our friends from everywhere else around the world are expecting on this kind of crossing. It's like, uh, okay, the cars can turn in at any time they want off Euston Road. Yep, we know that. <laughs> but at least the yield into pedestrians as they turn in. So it'll be a really interesting trial to do. Um, forget the passity concerns. Just know that people are going to cross. They don't know when cars are going to turn. For me, we have to give uh, some kind of a warning there. So that, that's a particularly um, like a cute example because there are hundreds of thousands of pedestrians crossing there every day. And it's really worrying if you ever stand there you only have to wait for a couple of minutes to see a car zoom off a mile above high street. So that, that will be an interesting next stage of, of research. So we started like uh, applying zebras and started using them at signals like uh, the entire rest of the world does. I want to get into like uh, the kind of big scene and really what, what very much excited me and Phil Jones back a few years ago about what we could do at Signal Junction. So it looks very similar to like the Wolf and Forest, like uh, Lee Bridge Road ones. And we did look at that and, um, uh, and th those schemes are great. I absolutely swear by those junctions. But we had like a two year debate to convince people to accept any kind of journey time loss for buses and the, and the lack of capacity from, from doing the Lee Bridge Road approaches a little bit. Whereas we showed in the Turn in the Corner report, if we'd done uh, give way and turn, a turn in the corner style rules, we could have had a capacity win and just done the scheme. So um, how does it work? I'll, I'll explain on this junction. I've done a rather cheeky like um, checkerboard zebra here. So it's like a zebra, but not quite a zebra, is it? Signal control. Anyway, so the, the way the operation works, if it was a standard junction in the UK, and let's say like the Lee Bridge Road ones, you'd have the traffic going from uh, north and south, we'll pretend it is on this drawing, and then east and west, and then an all pedestrian stage, and you can be quite cheeky, like the Libra Road one allowed a cyclist to go in that same stage and kind of manage the conflict through uncontrolled methods and zebras on the way out. Pretty good, three stages. The way, um, particularly in Denmark, um, they do it very popular, which is what the video that Chris Borden showed was, that you'd allow like uh, the north-south uh, general traffic to go, as well as the north-south pedestrians, as well as the north-south cyclists. Everybody's going up. But all cars or all motor traffic or any cyclists, anybody turning knows to yield to anything that's going ahead. That's the kind of a, a deviation from the, from the world that we had there. By applying the kind of signalized zebra, in this case, the, the parallel elephants, could we get that kind of behavior? That, that's the kind of interesting research question. Could we get the behavior that anybody who's ever been on holiday will recognize? You go, oh, I'm crossing, but the car's going. Are they completely insane? Oh, actually, they're really yielding and giving way to me. Why is there a row of four cars all waiting in the middle of the junction to turn while I walk? What is this madness? Would we be able to get that? And then the other, the other stage would be the east-west, all cars go, all peds, all cyclists. So two stages, no lost time. And, and lost time in, in traffic engineering is any time when, a, when motor traffic or a vehicle isn't moving. We call it lost time. So... With that third stage, that that's all pedestrian, albeit we keep cyclists in it to avoid the last time, but that's that's making it a lot less efficient than just cars going that way, cars going that way. It's, this is the way the, the rest of the world does it. Um, when we were doing the international best practice study and I sent consultants around the world to ask what people did, 
And everybody was completely shocked that we didn't have this. They're going, well, you must have horrific congestion. How'd you get anybody around your city? And we're going, as a matter of fact, we do actually, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's, it's not just good for capacity. It's that straight across pedestrian movement because the pedestrians going across, they going at the same time as cars. And you've got all the time that you would allocate to the more important car species to get right across there, albeit when they turn, they kind of have to yield to you. Now, the big issue with this approach, and it is an issue, and it very much is an issue, and I don't think we really uh, bottomed it out when we were last pushing these kind of ideas, but I'm certainly taking it seriously, is you kind of lose the, the sanctity of the green man, where you have got a green man in there, like someone with an impairment or any pedestrian, really, when that green man goes up, you know you've got a conflict-free walk to the other side of the road and we'd, we'd take that away if we did like the same rules as everybody else but i've been suggesting a kind of like a, a middle ground where you could use kind of like a worldwide rules but like maybe someone along with a visual impairment an old person um someone in a wheelchair anybody that really felt they needed it could like a like apply a key card get a little pass have an app on their phone connect with the junction and bring up old school good old blighty rules where a green man comes up you get that conflict free uh, walk straight across there you know they might have to wait a couple of cycles for it like to so we can synchronize with the rest of the uh, rest of the network but we can still bring up old school british rules and have it as an option then and we've got to remember at most of our signal junctions particularly uh, in london where i've experienced most of it people aren't waiting for that green man to cross most people are crossing in between the intergreens, they might not expect the green man to even be there in some cases, so they're getting quite used to running on the intergreens. So the, the stage is between when cars are moving. So everybody's kind of moving and going where they want, and knowing that they'll have to wait a minute or so to get a green man. And then, you know, why wait? Why not go now while there's a gap when one arm's finishing? So when people are doing that kind of behavior, the way the rest of the world does it is to have the signalized zebra. Uh, signalized zebra and then at least you're warning drivers to look out for pedestrians who aren't crossing on that green man so you get that kind of added safety feature all right enough theory let's show a little bit of this in practice as well oh yeah i wanted to make this point um london and and greater manchester and over in particular have signed up for the global street design guide it's great to sign up for it but when you look at any of the drawings every single intersection design's got signalized zebras on it a signalized parallel uh uh, cyclists where they've got the cyclist infrastructure it's just like the absolute mainstay so we signed up for a standards that we can't possibly do anywhere without changing fundamentally the way we do signal control so that that's the big issue of our time and uh, uh i know phil would say the same uh, uh we don't really want to retire before we've really given this thing a crack to see if it does work and, and i'm told um the uh, glc tried to do it in the 80s and uh kind of a, a ton of legislation came crashing down it but the the benefits are huge and and to be in line with the rest of the world when it comes to junction design and start having those capacity benefits start having a straight across pedestrian crossings with plenty of time to cross her it's not something to be sniffed at and it's so easy like a uh, from my job from doing cycling every time i've taken cyclists through a signal junction i know i'm in a two-year battle to make the case and what am I going to do to mitigate the loss? Whereas actually there could be a happy spell where we're just throwing cycle infrastructure in and making wins for everybody. Now I know I talked the other week and uh, Richard Butler and Jonathan Salter did about the Cyclops and it kind of gives you a little bit of a win. But that's it. That's uh, the wins there if you've already got the old pedestrian stage. If there isn't one you're applying it, you still get a loss. Whereas this could be applied where you haven't got a pedestrian stage and you can still get prioritize movements for pedestrians and cyclists without any loss of capacity on the junction and that's not to be sniffed at that's the majority of the uk junctions so let's have a look at i showed you the one on the on the left i showed you that picture i'd show you a little video here's someone crossing a signalized zebra let's uh let's see how they get on I might remind you of the 1949 one a car turned he waited for him to pass and then a car turned while it was a pedestrian green man yeah, that's it. That's, that's, that's the drama. The car waited. They let the person get across and then they nipped across there. Very inefficient. You're not waiting for the whole time for that ped green to, to finish. Then go, right, now it's conflict-free. Off you go. It's, that's the efficient way the rest of the world uh, uses their junctions. Clearly there are issues and clearly we have a, a different context. But 
there's there's been a lot of brick walls that we've hit on the pedestrian and cycling side when it comes to junctions and uh and for me this uh this could help us let's choose a completely non-controversial junction to to kind of show an example I, i've just mocked this up in five minutes so uh i'll show you later but um I've spent a good bit of my time looking at this junction, as I know, like uh, my former colleagues at Transport for London have, and, and the, the people at Southwark as well. It's a super highway that runs through this junction, and it's always like, a, what can you do to make it work? A, a real key junction here, Camberwell Road, Camberwell Church Street, what can you do? There's buses going through there. If we were to provide a um, segregated cyclist approach, we'd lose a, a little bit of a lane. That'd be a little bit of a problem because we'd have all our stages to go through. You can see the, the staggered ped movements. Um, everything that we've tried to do or attempted within the, the UK regulations has resulted in a in a loss of capacity and a, a real impact on bus journey times and a, and a general issue. Even though it's like a, there's quite a few collisions that happen at this junction and, and we'd love to solve them. But for me, we've tied one arm behind our back by not considering the kind of turning the corners kind of option. So you can see the staggers, you see it's difficult, we can't take much space away. How do you get someone across there safely? If you're trying to get cyclists across there safely uh, and they're segregated, you're going to have to introduce a whole new stage. It's going to be a, a lot of lost time. Uh, the pedestrian crossings would have to go straight across um, or maybe you do a, a cyclist. Anyway, what would the turn in the corner kind of rules look like if we had a kind of optional signal zebra just kind of drew drew it up in a dennis the money style in about five minutes but really that kind of arrangement is a you know completely like a 20 to 40 percent more efficient than what's there at the moment you get the straight across ped movements you can tie in the parallel one i've done those little uh black shapes there at a kind of protected junction so a cycle lane or track could come up the near side go through all move through you haven't got like a cyclist like weaving in and out of pedestrians you've just got the ones that are going from uh, again north to south cyclists cars pedestrians go on all those arms and anybody turning kind of yields to them east to west goes they yield there's plenty of space in the junction to do that right turn i've done this in a deliberately rough way because uh no one's paid me for designing it but th this is one of those junctions and one of those routes that again i don't want to retire without coming up with some kind of solution if it means i'm in a in a four-year research cycle and plan and trying to convince various authorities to test this stuff then great but there are solutions that the rest of the world uses to get across this and and i think it's uh, definitely worth a shake i can make this junction more efficient and get like a cleaner pedestrian and cycling movements across it while doing it it's uh, for me it's got to come back on the table and i think with the um with the kind of a uh, option of uh, bringing up old school British rules for, for people who really need that safety, I think it'll be fine. The rest of the time, it's we've got the same behaviour at junctions. We've just got different rules. People are stepping out and, and using more European timings. Nobody's really wants to wait longer than 20 seconds for their indication to, to come up or they're going to walk. This would uh, be a quick flip-flop between two stages. You can get the whole junction working. So, uh, Definitely worth thinking about. A little bit of a controversial finish there, but you know, this is what keeps me awake at night. That's uh, that's enough from me. Like, uh, I'll, I'll open it up to thingy. I'll stop sharing. There we go. All right. There we go. There's an interesting topic. Anybody uh, got any questions? Yeah, or? just a, a quickie. Yep. Uh, just what this reminded me of is that uh, there was a bit of uh, discussion on Twitter a while back because the Met Police's cycle safety team, which is the only bicycle mounted bicycle, uh, police officers uh, in, in Britain uh, uh, working for roads and traffic policing, uh, they were actually stopping and charging people who are cycling over zebras even when people had walked away from them. That's to say that if you look at that video when the car comes over the pedestrian crossing and people have been walking away from, from it, um, the, they, was, they actually felt they had to do this. I don't think it's something which people would be particularly concerned about as a problem when crossing on zebras. 
but there, there is that kind of obviously interest. I mean, Simon's got his finger up and he can go more into it, but I think it indicates there's that kind of entrenched idea that nobody should go over, nobody should drive or ride a bicycle over a zebra crossing while someone is still on it, even if they're over the other side of the zebra crossing. Right, Brian, can I come in here? Can I come in here? And, I've well, let, me get, let me do Simon first because he's had his finger up for a while, but we'll oh, come sorry, to you, yeah. Mark. Sorry. Well, I was, I was just going to say, following on from that directly, Kingston have their, I think it's the Fountain Roundabout, but they've got a scheme with five arm roundabout with every arm being zebras. And their engineers said to me and to the local group very specifically that you're allowed to ride on zebras. They, so they've done shared space with zebras. And, and my first question was, why not parallels? And they said, you can ride on a zebra. So I just, I, I'm not the engineers here, one of the engineers here. So I've been fascinated oh. with the answer is if the police, yeah, I can, I can, the police I can are explain that one. zebras. I can explain that you can ride on zebras. It was always like a little bit of a catch all that we had. So if it was shared use on one side and shared use on the other, then you can ride on the footways and you're allowed to ride on the road. So you can ride across a zebra. Now, riding through a zebra when someone's crossing it uh, is a different matter. That's what Bob was, and you're not allowed to do that. But you yes, could. Yes, you are. You could. You are. The, uh, so I, yeah. This is the point. So, first of all, just on your point on crossing, Brighton have a zebra where you it's signed just mount in one direction and signed to cycle in the other direction, which is a bit odd. Um, but that's that snuck in. But yeah, TFL's point of view is you can cycle on any road across the road from at right angles, whether or not yeah, you have a zebra. Not yeah, but, but on, on the zebras, so so it was Peter Murray, actually, from New London Architecture, who got stopped. Um, I don't think he was actually charged in the end. He argued his way out. And I went and looked at the, at the regs. And the regs say that you need to give priority to people on a zebra crossing. You don't need to stop for them. You uh -huh. need to give precedence. Sorry, you need to accord the technical words in the legislation, now, accord precedence. Now, your definition of accord precedence and mine might be different, but that is, the that is the actual word in the highway legislation. However, the legislation for parallel crossings is different. It's not, parallel crossings are not zebras that you can cycle over. A parallel crossing, the legislation actually says that all vehicles, and that includes cycles on the road who are crossing, i.e. going at 90 degrees to the parallel crossing, must stop while there is a person on a bike or a person on foot using the parallel crossing so they must stop until the person has the crossing person has reached the other side for the whole duration however the legislation is also really stupidly written because it only says that you have to stop while the person cycling is on the cycle side or the person walking is on the walking side so if you choose to walk along the elephant footprints bit of a parallel crossing or cycle on the zebra bit you're not given any protection in law well, you've still got the protection of don't run someone over. Yes, you. Yes, obviously you've got and, the protection. And you would expect you. someone like yeah, a reasonable person would expect someone to be crossing in the vicinity of a crossing. So why? Yeah, but you, you don't. You that? don't have the legal. You don't have the formal yeah, legal it's protection. Not the same. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. Can I? Can I actually? There is Which a way is bizarre. out. <laughs> can, can, there is a way out of that, and that uh, we are going to be getting fairly soonish. Uh, although we, we don't know what that means. Um, uh, consultation on uh, a revised highway code and one of the things in that will be attempts to clarify various issues such as this with regard to who gives way to whom when uh, people are crossing roads whether at uh, crossings of one kind or another or not so that's yeah, no, there's been a lot of work on that yeah, yeah. yeah Cycling UK and Living Streets have been all over that I was involved with it for a little while but yeah, it, it was taking it was taking its time, and I wanted to rush and try and build stuff, so I focused my efforts there. But yeah, it'd be really exciting to see that when it comes through. Um, anybody? Right, you... could I ask a question? A bit techy, Please. perhaps. Is yeah, that right? Um, yeah, that's what we're all here for. No, sorry. <laughs> it seems to me. I mean, there's a couple of things wrapped up in this, and yes, there's this issue about what hold you know the give way in in the turning as it in the UK would be to the left and whereas in Europe that to the right is, is taken as standard and yes I can see very strong arguments for doing that and all of the things that you were talking about in terms of capacity but wrapped up in that presentation there's a thing that does disturb me and this is as a sort of yep. semi-regular visitor to you know Europe land and when I come to a crossing which is in fact a signalized crossing and is marked out as a zebra 
and tr and my instinct is I have protection there, not thinking that it's that the signals may say otherwise. So whilst I am completely behind that, I I would be very uncomfortable about watering down the impact and safety that is provided by this i think i'm trying to pick up on what bob was saying yeah yeah so having a very specific marking for that kind of i think it's a great idea but um if it were a zebra i think i'd be massively uncomfortable one of the things that springs to mind is the pushback i think it was inappropriate by one of the groups from, i think it was rnib when some crossings went in in Hearn hill in london that were very nice and very lovely um rainbow crossings they were in that th th there was complaints about that that it undermined the zebra in fact they weren't zebras they were signalized crossings so there was no argument but i do think that touches on the important point so i would be uncomfortable on the idea of signalized zebras i think a zebra should retain that level of protection sorry that so you mean a signal control, control should retain that level of protection you know so this uh yeah didn't mean yeah. that to sound too forceful, but I do think no. there's an important distinction on that. No, you're speaking Otherwise, for a great many people, and that, and that was the argument at the time. Um, so, yeah, the, the, the key thing to, to know about this, so uh, I remember chatting this through with Adrian Lord back in the day, and I think he's on, so he'll probably remember this and I said a credit. So we wanted something that was recognisable as a zebra to get that kind of yield behaviour to a yeah. car, but not instantly recognisable as a zebra to a pedestrian so they started like it all was taking priority hence that kind of checkerboard effect and i showed it in a, yeah. in a very blurry picture but when you're standing there looking at it, you go what the hell's that <laughs> like it all oh, checkerboard thought, oh this is a little bit different and I go oh yeah well, i'm at a signal junction and there's poles and there's a there's a green man staring at me and okay this is suitably different but from a driver's perspective turning in it looks zebra enough to think oh it's a, it's a zebra now but uh but the look to kind of yield out. So we did dumb an R over the, the correct markings. And for me, that'd be, again, what I'm trying to do tonight is promote some areas of research. It'd be interesting to do a kind of ethical, like what do people recognise this as meaning? What would they do? Like all the stuff that we've been doing on the on the side road zebras. So I agree. I'm not, I'm not just saying like a willy nilly go out and do it. I'm kind of prompting some discussions for, um, for research. And maybe it's a case that like a kind of, some colourful crossing new marking does it i was gonna oh yeah i was gonna show a video of the panda crossing and uh i don't know whether you've uh, ever seen panda crossings that's a <laughs> that's everybody's home but that was an early experiment in kind of signalized zebras in the in the 60s i think it was 62 when that came out so yeah they had kind of like triangular thick and thin markings to kind of differentiate the difference um again recognizable as zebra like by cars but suitably different pedestrians to go ooh, hang about. But fundamentally, it's like the, the entire rest of the world does it. And it's, and it's a shock to us Brits when we go abroad and go, what is this? Is it a zebra? But it's, it's a brave uh, British person who steps out in a zebra going, I'll be just fine without having a look around. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, priority is not always friendly there either. Is in terms of communicating to say that younger children and... Um, that, and it's the implicit recognition that a zebra is a zebra. And I agree with all the things that have been said, yep. that they might not be respected, but at least having that distinction, I think is massively important. But otherwise, I think, yes, if we can establish what that is and establish a new language, a new visual language that speaks properly to that, both to drivers and to, to feds and cycles, then that is the way forward, most definitely. Very supportive. Yeah, but it, the, the, the truest visual language is the ones that mimic or represent zebras which is why I like it with all the implied ones, different thickness and bands, slightly different ones, hexagon block buses, but it's still, it's still like two tone, like color shape that, that makes people yield and makes drivers in particular think that's a place where pedestrians crossing and I should yield priority. So, but yeah, there's, there's two very different perspectives of height and shapes and, and weight and masses that we have to account for. And it'd be interesting to say that, but, but what you're saying is absolutely right. That's always been the, the thing where people go, oh, are you sure about this? Or we don't want to lose that sanctity of the green man. Um, but that, that's kind of why I think there's a, a chance for a kind of halfway house of, of calling up like a during the day, it could work as a full green man across and just go to old schools. But maybe like when it's busy and there's more pedestrians and, and people don't want to wait, we've got, we've got a duty of care to protect those that are jaywalking is, uh, is one of my... <laughs> There is, and so most people aren't waiting because they're waiting for that dedicated stage. It's taking too long to come in, 
But if it was just flip flopping between stages, then whenever you go, you kind of protected. It. It's a uh, you chase yourself round uh, on the tail on the safety on this one. But well, you're absolutely right to raise it, and that you know that's why you wouldn't really go on site until you tested all these things out thoroughly. But uh, I'm prodding in the area. The winds are potentially enormous. I said this to yeah. Living Streets one. I said everything you want can be done if we have this time to cross straight across. You know all, all that stuff. Uh, I see Simon's got his hand up again. Yeah, go for it. Simon. I mean, I was just going to say. I think I think the point you just made about jaywalking is the absolute vital one here. You know, what was it a bank junction? It was like ninety percent of people were crossing against a red and things like that, and that was one of the issues. So uh, you know, I think that. We, you know, we've got two minute waits and things like that on so many junctions in London that, that, you know, anything that can be done to ensure that people can cross safely, even if they're crossing against a red, I think is, is really vital. Yeah, that's why I wanted to show that kind of Marleybone one. So the kind of classic leave it out. But like, a, for me, you still deserve some element of protection. Uh, but putting in the green man there, would be a complete nightmare. You're talking like a, a two million pound annual value of time loss on putting a green man in there. That's uh, that's the ridiculous state of affairs. Um, anybody else got any questions? We're kind of getting towards the end now anyway. Uh, I was trying to give you food food for thought and let you into my uh, my uh, five year master plan. I have a question, Brian, it's Shane Foran. Um It's kind of stepping back a bit. Like if we're looking at cr- Oh, we're looking at Dutch practice, we're talking about segregating people in time as well as space. Yeah. And you brought up the example of the manual that they just co-opted some practice from abroad without really understanding the assumptions behind it. Yeah. Is there any good review out there that reviews the assumptions behind UK traffic signal design and other traffic signal operation so that you could explain to somebody what you're seeing in the drawing is not what you see in your head Based yeah. on your work and assumptions. I draw your attention to the International Best Pro- Best Practice Cycling Infrastructure Study. Another, uh, took a long time to say that, but it's on the TFL website. Um, basically, the company I work for now, Urban Movement, put it together. And I, and I was at TFL at the time, sending them around the world to, to look what people did. And I, and I kind of referenced it slightly in the talk there. But yeah, um, the, the big question you're asking is no, there's another potential part of research of like, why we went one way and everybody else went another, what the pros and cons, but like, and, and people in the UK will swear by our safety record. It's just in, in practice uh, across the UK, people are leaving green men out if it's going to have any impact on capacity in our, our signal junctions. And they should be providing safety and they're not. And it becomes this kind of a, this capacity implication. So you can't really do anything, including getting a pedestrian crossing in, Whereas if you were to do it in a similar practice to the rest of the world, you could get something in. And and what I'm saying now that's different to when we're, uh, we're pushing this is uh, the turn in the corner was like an overall rule. Now I'm trying to make it optional. An optional for a place like uh, Camberwell um, um, Church Street there, um, where like, what do you do? Anything you do is going to affect capacity. You're going to have to do some kind of Hail Mary shot here could we look at some kind of European practice and, and test something in those situations where it's really difficult to, to cater for PEDS, to get anything in for cycling in there? And that's the situation we'll have around the rest of the UK. Every place where we haven't provided a green man, we can't really get anything in for cycling. And it's going to, and it, you'll have the same issue with a, if it's an island, that voice that I'm hearing. Um, it, it's the same problem. We get it and you've got this almighty battle, whereas the way the rest of the world does it is to apply these rules give ourselves that option and 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 really my my job is to try to get as many options as i need to do a job and to actually do a route like uh still trying to sort out side roads 20 years after starting this kind of i think i've got a bit of a handle on links now and when it comes to junctions we're getting more and more options but we're still three or four shy of the options that the rest of the world has so we can't do a proper job we keep coming across brick walls like the Camberwell one, we go, what do you do? And I, and I can't help but say, oh, well, this is how the rest of the world would do it. We go, oh, that's the rest of the world. Uh, we've gone a different way here. So uh, for me, uh, I think it's worth testing these things to see if we can make them work in the UK context. So I'm trying to unpack some of the variables tonight and uh, give people a bit of an idea. But yeah, it's a, it's a bumpy ride. Uh, everything in, in highway engineering and traffic engineering is, we've got to find our own way there. But it's interesting to see the experiments that we did in the past 
you know, the pandas and the, and that first like a stud only beacon crossing that I showed from 1949. Really interesting. We did use to test stuff out in this country and I, and I hope we can get back to that 